It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, Professor Timmy Gambin from the University of Malta. Timmy is an Associate Professor of Maritime Archaeology in the Department of Classics and Archaeology at the University, where he obtained his BA in History. Following his undergraduate studies, he went on to attain an MA in Maritime Archaeology and History at the University of Bristol in the UK, where he continued his postgraduate studies by reading for a doctorate in Maritime Archaeology. As well as working in Malta, Timmy has directed numerous offshore underwater surveys in various parts of the world, including the Mediterranean, Spain, Greece and Croatia. And he counts amongst his many research interests the use of technologies for underwater exploration, which is, I suppose, what he's going to talk to us about today. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity to, uh, to give this uh this talk tonight via this, uh, this, this webinar. And um, I'll be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes. And I hope that by the end of the uh, webinar, the audience won't be suffering from uh, side scan uh, sonar fatigue. Let me start by, by saying two things. One, I am a self-confessed uh, side scan fiend. Okay, so, so if you have to if one had to ask me to stop doing anything uh, or, or from all the projects that I do and to keep just one thing, it, uh, it is the, uh, the use of, uh, of, of side scan sonar to map, uh, to map the seabed. Um, and because of this uh, fixation that I have of, of, of mapping the seabed, then I think that everybody else should love uh, side scan sonar. So, I mean, I have a few uh, a few fellow soulmates, and George, uh, who's kindly joined us today, Papa Deodoro, is, is 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 one of them. Hopefully, by the end of the talk, I uh, I would be able to 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 sort of share with you why and how important um, this uh, this instrument this instrument is. Before I continue, the the other thing that I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to add is I have no slides explaining what side scan sonar is. I was in a bit of a quandary whether to, to, to include such a slide, but when you have the inventor of the technology in the audience, uh, I thought it would be uh, sort of uh, a bit crass to, 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 include, to include the slide. But, but in essence, what, what side scan is, it, it uses sound, okay, to, uh, to create kind of images of sound um, of uh, of the seabed, and believe me, you'll be you'll be seeing a lot of these images in the uh, in the coming forty minutes. So, in uh, when I started off, I started off uh, using a toad system. Okay, so so the toad fish that you saw in the previous image is, is connected via a, a, a cable, which is connected via a TPU, a, a surface processing unit. And what this is doing is, is it's processing the sound waves that the towfish is picking up, sending them to the processing unit and, uh, and changing these into, into an image. And this is a, a typical setup um, of, of, for, for operating a towed system. You've got the skipper who's, who's uh, keeping straight, uh, straight lines and the sonar operator who's making sure that the, 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 the towfish is at the right height of the seabed. Okay, and I've spent many, many, many an hour with these two, uh, two chaps um, scanning, scanning the seabed. Um, some of the earliest projects I, I was involved in, this is a survey of uh, Cartagena in, uh, in Spain. Uh, and, and I'm starting with the end product. So, so this is uh, once we've gone out surveying with the toad system, we've, we've brought the data, we've brought the data set back, we've mosaiced it, okay, in, in specialized software, which we'll be seeing in a few, in a few minutes time. And uh, this is one of the main deliverables. You, uh, what you have here in essence is a, an archeological map of the seabed, of the approaches to, uh, to Cartagena Harbor. And the images that I'm going to be showing you in the next slides are actually from this survey. So, um, and I use them to illustrate a, uh, a workflow example. So this is what uh, an ancient shipwreck looks like in kind of a medium resolution 
uh, sonar image. We, we were using a 400, a Klein 450 kilohertz uh, side scan here, and this is a target that caught that caught our, uh, our attention. We went back with a, uh, a higher resolution sonar. This is a 900 kilohertz, so now you can begin to make out individual objects. The uh, the roundness of, uh, of, of, of some of the objects um, clearly indicate that this is something uh, different to, to other, other targets that we were seeing in the, uh, in, the, in, in the sonar record. In fact, not only is it different, but it is actually, you, you, you can actually distinguish the fact that uh, some of them um, you know that, that that this is a mound of uh, of amphoras. Uh, taking a different side scan, so this is this is a, a, another towfish, which is a combined side scan and sub bottom profiler. A sub bottom profiler uh, reads, penetrates into the sediment, and on the top you've got the reading of uh, of the side scan, and at the bottom you can actually see that the rest of the uh, of the site penetrates into the seabed. So uh, it's data like these help us not only measure the site that is visible, but also we can start to pick up an idea of how much of the site is actually present, uh, if at all, in the seabed. And this, you know, for uh, aspects such as planning excavations, logistics and so on, is invaluable, invaluable uh, knowledge. Uh, I also chose these photo, these uh, images uh, of the images of this workflow because uh, George Papadeoru, Papadeoru, Theodoru, and myself are working on a paper, and hopefully he'll be able to tell us something with regard to how we can revisit legacy data and help and use legacy data to help us interpret uh, new new data. Um, this is a, a close-up, so in the bottom right-hand corner, you can actually see sort of individual uh, amphorae in the, uh, in the, in the cumulus. Right. Um, I, I, I love working with a toll system, but a toll system is not without its hazards. I, um, I'd like you to see to to focus on that uh, those two lines. Unfortunately, I can't get my pointer to uh, to work, but there are two lines that go towards the green dotted line, um, and that is that is a rope that was uh, that was um, floating from a uh, a World War II shipwreck, and um, the sonar operator who was who was working on this project. It wasn't me, I won't obviously say who it was, I won't throw, throw him under the bus. Um, passed the, uh, the side scan through that rope, okay, and uh, we, lost, we lost the towfish. Now, of all the places it had to land, it didn't land directly in the seabed, but it actually landed in a depth charge. Uh, I kid you not, this is a, a genuine uh, picture of my towfish in... Uh, uh, penetrated into a a, uh, a depth charge. We did recover the towfish, it still works, etc. But this got me thinking of, of sort of working in a simpler way and something that won't be as stressful uh, as, as as having three, four, five hundred meters of cable out uh, in the in the sea. So the university, uh, through uh, some European funding, we, we were lucky to acquire a, uh, an AUV, an automated underwater vehicle. The, uh, the AUV is what it says it, it is, which is a vehicle, and this vehicle carries payloads. So it's got a, a, a multi-beam, and it also has a dual uh, frequency side scan zone, so 600 kilohertz medium to high uh, resolution and then one, uh, 1600 kilohertz which is very which produces some very high uh, resolution uh, side scan imagery uh, this is it uh, in in the waters of malta as you can see we work in some very challenging climatic conditions um, and this photo actually shows 
that even an AUV is not without problems. Um, this is an AUV that belongs to a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Professor Chris uh, Clark from Har Harvey Mudd University in the States. Uh, this particular AUV surfaces in between lines to find out where, where she is. Um, in between some of the lines, we, we, we lost her. Uh, we were, and whilst looking for her, we saw this, this bright yellow AUV on the side of a private yacht. They uh, saw it, uh, lost, uh, like, like a lost puppy, picked it up, and thank goodness we found them and, and were able to, to, to retrieve it. Okay, so this is, again, typical workflow for, um, for an AUV survey. Um, we plan, just as one would plan for a towed survey, so those lines are the lines we are, we are asking the AUV to follow. Um, there are certain parameters. You can set sort of how wide apart you want the lines, which and then determine how much overlap, how far you're going to open the, the, the range of, of, of the sonar, etc., etc. So these are all parameters that you can set in the software uh, beforehand. I've got a, a, a short video which I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk you through. So this is a project I'll be speaking about uh, soon we, we, that we run with RPM Nautical and the Superintendenza del Mare in Sicily, uh, where we use a, a side scan to, to map a, a battle scene. Actually, in the, in the bottom left hand, hand corner, you can actually see a, a shipwreck coming coming into uh, into view. So what we what we do is sometimes we'll we'll, we'll tie. Uh, sorry, we'll cable tie actually a uh, a, a parallels camera to uh, to the AUV so that at least we get some footage of it of it in in action. Um, so based on <coughs> our current parameters, um, a normal eight to ten hour working day at sea gives um, allows us to cover between uh, five and six square kilometers per day. So the idea in Malta is to um, cover the entire um, seabed in our territorial waters, which measure um, about 3,000 square kilometers. We're fast approaching halfway. Okay, I haven't counted of, of, of late or measured of late, but we're fast approaching of late. So what you see here, I think are three days, three blocks of of, of work. But I, I stand to be to be corrected. I'm sure my um, my research colleague Alberto is watching and telling me what the hell. That's six days work. And um, so this is a close up. Two, three. This is actually four days, four days of work. This is a close up of an area that we're doing uh, um, that we started recently. When I say recently, actually last week one that uh, is going to be completed in the bottom right hand corner and uh, it's going to be completed this coming Friday, uh, weather permitting. Okay, so slowly, slowly, as I said, we're, we're sort of building these blocks around the uh, around uh, the Maltese Islands. There isn't everything that we've done. In fact, there are some some important chunks, uh, some chunks missing, but it's it's it gives you a clear idea as to sort of how we're systematically um, scanning scanning the the seabed around around our islands okay so once we have the data in in uh, in our hands i use the gumbean classification system okay and this complex and very high-tech system can involve the marking of a, a target on on a printed paper with the letter c it can also be an asterisk, and sometimes it can be an asterisk with a an instruction like plot. You know, if we're plotting these on the on the GPS. So what I'm going to be what I'm going to be discussing in the coming slides is when you're covering so much uh, ground, okay, or, or, or seabed, you do come across numerous, numerous targets. And unless you spend your entire life at sea 24-7, then 
you've got to come up with some kind of classification and say, look, you know, sort of, I really would like to look at all the targets, but I only have the time and or the budget to look at 10. So something has to determine which 10 out of 30, 40, 50, you're going to, you're going to uh, be, be, look at, be looking at. So the Gumbian classification actually sees, sees us marking things as A, B, and C. So A is top of the list. If it's an A, we definitely want to go there, be it with an ROV or with our dive team, okay? If it's a B, ah, it's, it's important, we want to go there, but only if we've, if we've done all the A's. If it's a C, then, if, you know, if we've got money to, to, to throw away and we've done all the A's and all the B's that have, you know, been building up as a backlog, because by the time we come to do the B's of two years ago, we've got a whole set of other A's from this year, for example, and so on and so forth. So, so the C's keep on dropping down. Um, in in in, the, in this classification list now quite obviously the most important find that i've never found is how gambin has designated it as a c and that's the bronze statue that sort of you know uh, every or many maritime archaeologists would like to would like to discover okay so what's an a that's pretty much an aeroplane you don't need to be a side scan expert you don't need to be an aviation archaeologist to recognize that as an aircraft this is literally raw out of a generic a generic survey we were just lucky that the side scan passed very close we didn't know it was there and this this image is so detailed that we're actually now being able to recognize what type of aircraft um, we're finding if they are intact solely from the um, solely from the, uh, the the sonar image. There are in this particular case a couple of telltale um, telltale signs such as such as the void. You can see like a black dot towards the tail. Okay, that is the space, the void that would have uh, housed the uh, the emergency dinghy and 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 this clearly tells tells me that this is a ju88 um a, a, a junkers 88 plus with measurements of the wingspan the length of the plane the fact that it's a twin engine etc then you can actually um you know confirm confirm this even even further so this is definitely an a definitely a site we'd go and visit which in fact we did uh, take take our cameras and then create a, a 3D photogrammetric uh, model of uh, of the site. Here you can see the void um, at the back that 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 shows up in the in the site scan in the site scan image. Okay, this is an A as well. You've got a, a, a vessel, you know, World War, either World War One or World War Two. So 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 the site scan image is showing us that we have a shipwreck now. Um, unlike unlike a plane, a, a ship is very difficult to distinguish unless you know what you're looking for, meaning you're looking for a particular wreck. Then it's very difficult to say this is HMS whatever or, or SS something else. Um, but here it's quite clear that, that we have a shipwreck. We can tell that it has a, a broken back. Okay, so, so, so this must have hit, hit a mine at some, at some point, in fact. Um, it is bang in the middle of a uh, of a former German German minefield. As this is again uh, lucky that we passed over it like that. This is this is a sonar image of HMS Edge, which we uh, discovered in in 2019. Okay, so so uh, this is a um, a U class uh, submarine. Again. Sort of no 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 doubt that we're looking at a uh, a submarine. This confuses us some uh, a little because it's slightly shorter when we measured it on 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 sonar. It was slightly shorter 
than the U-class submarine. Eventually, when we uh, visited it with, a, with an ROV to, to, to survey her, um, we realized that the bow was, was blown off. So, so she's minus four or five meters. And this is an, definitely an A. Um, when it comes to, to ancient shipwrecks, you can actually uh, see not only the, 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 the cumulus of, of, of amphorae, but also the individual ones in the, uh, in the small debris field around. So these are A's. The, the, these go to the top of the list. Um, come what may, we will, we will deploy an ROV and or a, a, team, of, a, a team of divers to, uh, to explore. Now, whether it's an ROV, a remote operated vehicle, or divers, obviously depend on depths. We visit anything up to 125 meters uh, approximately our, our, ourselves. Okay, so for example, that JU88, which, uh, for which you saw the photogrammetric model, is at a depth of uh, 110, 110 meters. If it's deeper than that, or we have, we have suspicion that it has uh, unexploded ordnance, then um, we will visit with uh, a remote operated vehicle uh, first. Okay, so sometimes an A has a question mark. So this is a, 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 uh, an image of the Phoenician ship, shipwreck, that, uh, on, on which we have a, a quite a large project going on. Um, and very distinct from the seabed around it. Okay, so this eventually turns out to be to be something very exciting. But and then something like this. This is this is an image of what I was convinced was what was another amphora wreck in Croatia, but which turned out to be the most spectacular um, rock-shaped amphora site I have ever ever seen. Or amphora shaped rock site so you 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 get the gist of what i mean they were rocks okay so you can be you can be fooled or oh, i i was fooled anyway what's a b okay so this looks like a plane something you know or part of a plane um it looks aviation like um not as well preserved not as uh, not as 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 obvious uh, as, as the first sonar image of the plane that I that I showed, um, so it's a B. We had time; it was deep. We had an ROV available. Um, we we surveyed her, and this turned out to be a a drone. So Malta was was a NATO base, and then you know up until 1979, in the 50s and 60s, the the, the British and the Americans used to to uh, tow these drones in the air so as to practice with anti-aircraft gunning and obviously um, they would they would crash into the sea and they look very very plain like so um they're important to have a record uh however to have a record of however if you have a choice between this and and and, and something slightly older or, or what we believe to be of more archaeological value but with limited time with, with, the, with the remote operated vehicle, if we can recognize it as a drone pretty confidently, then we know we can take it and, and, and not visit. And I say this because this is not the only one. We've, we, we, in the beginning, we, we got records of about five or six of these. They're all over the place. This is the B. Um, we, we, I, I can tell you what this is straight away. This is a, a, an, an aircraft crash site. Not, I mean, I can obviously say what it is because I, I, I've, I've visited with, uh, with, a, with an ROV in this particular case. But also because we've come across so many of, uh, of these sites that we're able to, to, uh, to distinguish them quite, um, quite automatically, sort of in, 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 in autopilot. Um, one of the things that we're working on is using side scan, uh, side scan imagery to determine the crash dynamics. So when a plane crashes into the sea, it can ditch in full control, it can explode in the air and then sort of the debris falls over a wide area, it can hit the sea at terminal velocity and break up in a limited area and then sink. So. Um, 
the use of, of, of side scan imagery is helping us to understand the crash, the crash dynamics of these planes. This would be a B, again, because of sheer numbers. Now, sort of what is more archaeologically valuable, an entire plane or a crashed plane? And I'm not sort of giving, the, I, I cannot give you the, the, the answer, but uh, because there are so many targets, then some have to fall down in the list of classification. So, but in this particular case, and in most cases with bees that we classify as crash sites, we do visit them and and uh, pick up uh, pick up footage. You know, about an hour of video and a couple of hundred uh, of stills. Okay, so back to uh, the project I mentioned before with the video. This is a project, um, as I said, being run by RPM Nautical. Uh, together with the superintendents of the seed, the University of Malta has uh, joined the project uh, quite recently. We started using site scan in 2019 and returned again in 2020. The, the gray bits of site scan overlay the bathymetry, which is what we did in 2019. The, uh, the bronze, the bronze uh, site scan is what we covered in 2020. So this, this is the uh, Battle of Egadi project where RPM uh, have been working for, for over, well over 15 years now, searching the area for the, for the remains of the battle between the Carthaginians and, and the Romans. Um, whereas prior to, to, to the research of RPM, there were, I don't know, three or four rams uh, in the archaeological record of the entire globe. Now, um, just from Egadi alone, there are about 23 or, or, or 24. Um, so, what we're looking for here, we're systematically mapping, we're using slightly higher resolution, so, so smaller range, um, more overlap, uh, etc. But we're not looking for things like planes, although if there is a plane in the search area, we're going to find it. We're looking for individual objects, for amphoras and also rams. So in a typical day, in I think in Egadi we cover about three square kilometers, three to four square kilometers instead of five to six. In a typical day, this is the kind of uh, the amount of targets that we end up with. So some form of classification, there has to be some form of classification because, you know, unless somebody is going to work for another 20 years visiting every single, every single target. I mean, look at those target numbers, 1538, target number 1538. In a 200 by 200 meter area, this is the kind of um, target um, concentration that uh, that we have you clearly can't see the targets that we're marking out because they are so small and um, don't get a fright but this is these are this is the amount of targets that we have from the entire uh, 2020 season so this is not looking at the 2019 season this is just the 2020 season and we're going back in 2021 and possibly also 2022. Um, what's guiding me here, what's guiding me and the strategy that we're, that, that we're using here is we're going to follow each cultural contact if they're related to the battle. We have a buffer zone, something like 500 meters. The, the, the moment we have a buffer of 500 meters without a cultural contact, which is related to the battle, and then we can say that we've uh, delineated the entire the entire area of the battle. Now, knowing my luck, some Carthaginian warship limped all the way back to uh, to Tunisia, dropping an amphora every 495th meter, and obviously we'll have to follow the battle all the way across the Mediterranean. Not something that I would complain about, as long as I can get some good side scan data. From that, uh, from that mission. Um, 
RPM deploy the the ROV. Okay, so I sit down with uh, with George of uh, George Rob of RPM. We, we we argue, we discuss. George has the Rob uh, classification system. Timmy has the Gambine classification system. We discuss. We come up with uh, with a with a target list. Okay, and these this is the size of targets that we are looking at. So on the sorry, I'll I'll, I'll go back. So this is what turned out to be an amphora you can see a slightly rounded shape you can see a dent which is which you know a, 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 a small shadow which creates a dent where, where basically I, I i look at this and i see i see an amphora and then this looks like debris on the seabed the top target is what caught my eye and especially the forked shadow okay so so essentially we're looking at data and picking up literally thousands of targets like like these um, as i said RP rpm uh, deployed the the rov they, they go and visit specific targets and this was one of the targets from these are targets from the 2019 survey that rpm visited in uh, 2019 so straight after with the with the um, rov and uh, these are the first I think we found three or four rams with uh, with the uh, with side scan. They're the first rams, to the best of my knowledge, ever found with a side scan with a side scan system. That's a, a, another ram. I think we found four in 2019. We haven't visited targets of 2020. I'm pretty certain that uh, that we may have some some more uh, rams from the 2020 survey. Um, and we're actually identifying on sonar and going to to these targets we're actually identifying items as small as a roman helmet in the sonar in the sonar record this is a, Ro a roman helmet which was first detected by by side scan and then visited with the with the rov um, again i have to reiterate this this project is a perfect example as to why we need a, a, a system of classification uh, and why um, side scan in the, in, in, in the first place is so important because not only does it help you to identify archaeology on the seabed, but it also helps you to economize. Okay, if, if you sort of approach with the low res and the followed by a high res uh, survey, and we'll be seeing this in, 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 in a few slides time, it also helps you economize um with regard to your your post survey work your post site scan work okay now we come to the b's b minuses and c this b minus c obviously now i know i know better the thing that caught my eye was okay there's nothing like it uh, in, in on the surrounding seabed uh, and it's the scouring so so it's that kind of halo around the target that um, caught caught my eye so this was yeah you know if we've got time we'll visit it with the rovs at a depth of 155 meters and this turned out to be a shipwreck from the early 1800s carrying a cargo of of sulfur you can see some of the wooden elements still uh, still in situ and um, we were able to date it from uh, the crew's quarters which which you know it seemed that the crew like the the alcohol as well lots of gin bottles and wine bottles um but so 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 something that um was a b minus or a c turned out to be very much an an a this is a flat um you all of a sudden you're seeing a blue image so 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 sonar doesn't doesn't have color you can you can determine what color you want to see it in according to, to the software that you're using. And sometimes out of desperation, you can invert, uh, invert the, uh, the coloring of the image, okay, so that you can perhaps see something that somebody else is not seeing. In this particular one, this is, this is off an island called uh, Palmarola in, in, in Italy. I was accused by the ROV pilot that I was just making this up and just to have, you know, time out to go and to go and visit uh, whatever he thought it was and this turned out to be um 
what seems to be a very old ballast pile. That round uh, stone over there is, is a uh, quern, so clearly a ship part of the shipboard equipment. Uh, and you can also see some some fragments of, uh, of of pottery. So if I hadn't insisted to visit this, this would have just remained a splat in the uh, in the sonar record and 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 this wreck would not have been I identified. Okay, there are times when you think you have a, a C plus and it turns out to be uh, to be an F. So this, I believe, is, is, is an image from last year, you have very, very clean sonar data, the difference between a towed system, a towed system will translate all the vibration of, uh, of the cable, of the hundred meter, hundreds of meters of cable, also the waves um, will, be, will be picked up in the sonar data. You can, you can easily identify side scan data from an AUV because it's so clean, it doesn't have, it doesn't have all these interferences. This is from last year. I was pretty sure we might have something, you know, when you compare it to what the sulfur wreck uh, looks like in, in the sonar record, the one on the left, to me, actually looks more promising than, than the one on the right that turned out to be a sulfur wreck. So, you know, there again, I, I, I confidently um, asked Alberto to revisit the, the site with a 1,600 uh, um, kilohertz survey. And this is this is a close up of, of, of what I thought was was another shipwreck. And then the 1600 kilo kilohertz survey um, told us that it was just a pile of cable on the uh, on the on the seabed. So that's that. And that is in 1600 kilohertz. So the fact that we went out with high resolution actually saved us from diving it or taking out a, an AUV. So getting high resolution site scan imagery makes the operation even more uh, economical. And when it is an A plus, um, I'm, I'm coming to, uh, to, to the end of, uh, of, of my talk. So in this, in this particular case, it could be an air aircraft crash site. You know, there are a couple of, of, of straight lines there, which, which are not convincing. You know, but we were close by. We, we, we this this actually the the one thousand six hundred um, kilohertz survey that, uh, that I just showed of, of the cable was done on the same day. So we were going out anyway. I asked Alberto to survey to survey this site, and lo and behold, now you can start to see some details. You can see very round uh, objects. You can see two linear objects that are, are, are to me straight away are crying out cannon and also in the shadow on the left hand side you can see what what uh, uh, could very well be an, an anchor and also some anchor like objects in the bottom middle of the uh, of the image so we did organize uh, organize a dive that is the anchor which was on the left hand side of the sonar image okay um, in the rest of the this this site is at about 105 meters deep um the rest of the site actually is indicative of of, of sort of what a fine line it is between uh, identifying things like uh, like 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 just a shipwreck like this or distinguishing it between between what we're seeing here and possibly a natural a natural feature these are the two uh, the two cannons. This is a, a shipwreck from the 1700s. Okay, so something very rare in our waters, and something that uh, we we uh, decided to 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 study and to survey in more in more detail. You can see one of the round objects. There were three large large cooking pots on the uh, on the site. Okay, um, and whilst here I'm inspecting, I'm inspecting the site, but at the same time, there you see somebody actually recording, so, so capturing data to create a, uh, a 3D image, a 3D photogrammetric image of this, uh, of this uh, shipwreck. So again, from these images, you can see how, how low the actual archaeological site and, you know, unless, unless sort of... <sighs> 
unless you visited the site, it would be very, very easy to mistake that site for, 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 for rocks or that part of the, of the site for, for rocks. So this is a, uh, a, a early version of the photogrammetry that we, that we did of the site. We obviously filled in the area in the, in, in the bottom, bottom right. Um, um, so, so this is a, what we're calling the cannon wreck from the early 1700s of, uh, of Malta. Um, we do use photogrammetry to, to create digital elevation models. Okay, you'll notice that right angle in the, in the image on the left-hand side. Um, we call it a Johnometer. John, John Wood is hopefully on, online as well, and he's created this system whereby um, we're able to, to, to uh, get X, Y, and Z data for the for the site. So if we go back uh, in three years' time, and there's been sort of sediment movement, and more of the site is exposed, we'll be able to actually measure to what extent the site is being exposed or or not. So, uh, and this is uh, created on the base of the uh, photogrammetric uh, survey. So the red parts, so just the anchors, 83 uh, centimeters from from our our baseline. Okay, I'm coming up to my uh, to my 40 minutes. Conclusions. And there's no one size fits all. So you know, one can publish. This is in my my methodology. It works for me, but it may not work for B or for C. But I can give indications, pointers, etc., to what has worked for me in my in my context. If in doubt, even if you think it's a, you know, if you see and you have time, you've got a double check and triple, triple check. Okay. Three, very important, the gum beans grading system is absolute rubbish and must never ever be used. Okay. Unless by gum bean himself. So over the years, I've been uh, really lucky to work with a number of people in the field of uh, offshore survey. Okay, um, the guy in the bottom right hand is, uh, corner is, is my right hand man when it comes to offshore survey and many other things. Alberto, I want to thank him publicly from here for his patience. Um, but the main guy I would like to mention in this talk is this guy here, Gary Kozak. He's taught me uh, everything I know about side scan. And he and he alone will know what this picture on the right means to us. Um, I'm sure that you're fed up of side scan sonar images and hearing kilohertz and this and that and the other. So I'm ending with a nice, much more relaxing photograph and would like to thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, folks. So we have been joined, or Timmy has been joined by um colleagues in the profession to help ask questions and answer questions and to give their views as well. So let's start with Megan. Do you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so I'm Megan. I work as a senior marine geophysicist for a company called Wessex Archaeology. Uh, so I'm based in Salisbury, which is where their head office is, and my job is to interpret geophysical data. So that includes side scan sonar and uh, also marine magnetometer sub-bottom profiler and uh, multi-beam echo sounder data to try and identify features of archaeological potential on and below the seabed. Brilliant. Thank you, Megan. Um, we've also been joined by Martin or Marty Klein. Uh, Marty, do you want to uh, introduce yourself and say hello? Well, hi, I'm, it's Marty Klein and uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm talking from Boston. It's still kind of winter here. There's still a little bit of snow outside. But it's an honor for me to be here. I I feel like it shouldn't be legal for me. This is like side scan porn. I don't know if it should, <laughs> it should be legal for me to be watching this show, but I hope none of you will report me to the authorities. It's, it's <laughs> oh, brilliant. The, circuit, the camera is only showing your top half, Marty, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then we're also have been joined by George Papathiodoru uh, from the University of Patras. Hello, George. Hello, Mark. Thank you for your, your Greek pronunciation. It's excellent. 
Thank you. Uh, for my long uh, surname. So, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is George Papa Theodore, and I'm a professor of environmental and geological oceanography. And to cut the long story short, I'm a typical, let's say, marine geologist. But in the last 20 years, I have spent a lot, a lot of time for searching basin shipwrecks and uh, submerged prehistoric landscape all over the Mediterranean Sea, but uh, particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea and uh, in Alexandria and Lebanon with the support of uh, Honor Frost Foundation. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so. Um, we do have questions from the audience already, but the beauty of being the host is I get to ask my questions first. Um, it's one of the perks of uh, organising these sorts of things. And, and Timmy, my questions, actually there's a couple of them. It links to your efforts to side scan the entire coastline of Malta, which I, I know Malta's you know, a small island, as one of the smallest nations in Europe, if not the smallest. Um, how much have you got to cover? How long is it going to take? When will you be done? Are other agencies helping? Are you? Is it just you guys at the university um, doing this? And in terms of my final bit, in terms of the use of the data, because presumably this has the data sets have much more use beyond heritage. Okay, you're cheating here, Mark, because that's about <laughs> five questions in one, not one. <laughs> but anyway. I'll attempt to answer them all. So um, there's about 3,500 square kilometers, and we're we're approaching uh, 1,500 square kilometers. I think that uh, within the next seven to ten years, we uh, we should be we should be done. The only limitation is um, the budget th that we have for a boat. We've put in an application for funding for for our own boat. Um, but anyway, those are those are joys yet to come. Um, does anybody else help? It's not that uh, no, because we have a very specific resolu uh, resolution that we work at and a very specific methodology that we work at. So um, I will accept data, for example, from a, a pipeline survey that's semi-passing through our territorial waters. But almost inadvertently, we always have to go back and survey to our own to our own requirements. Now, with regard to the use of the data, yes, of course. I mean, obviously, I didn't want to go into the detail because it was more about the subtle, more about sort of discovering things that are not that are not obvious. But uh, we do work very closely with the marine biology department. Okay, and. Uh, also with the environmental uh, authority in Malta, because sometimes you, find you come across things that are not very pleasant, like, I don't know, dumped 45 gallon drums, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we are very open to, to collaboration. In fact, not only within our institution itself, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, George Papadeotoro's team and, 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 and my team are, are collaborating on some legacy data in order to help future generation of uh, side scan freaks and not only maybe others as well <laughs> side scan freaks is that how you describe yourselves <laughs> i in the beginning i described myself as a side scan fiend uh, marty mentioned side scan porn i mean i can look at side scan data 24 7. We've got a question from Richard uh, about, uh, no, sorry, about from uh, Lorna about the depth range. Um, I mean, what are you limited? Is it is whether you're presumably if you're towed, you you're limited. But if you are on an AUV, what's your depth limitations? Okay, so the AUV we operate has a depth limitation of 500 meters, which will most of Malta's territorial waters are shallower than 500. There are some parts that are that are between um, 500 and 1,000, um, and that will be the time when I'll apply for, for an upgrade of the AU, not to change the AUV. Uh, what will need to be changed is the software that will enable it to take, to go down, to go down further. So the 
the answer so far is that yes, we are limited to the 500 meter contour. I'm wondering what Marty makes of having side scan mounted on AUVs sort of swimming around the sea independently by themselves. Well, I think it's wonderful. I actually, it's something I started. Uh, when these things were first made, uh, some of the earliest ones were at MIT, Sea Grant, and at the University of New Hampshire, the EVE vehicle way back in, in the 20th century. Uh, I noticed that these vehicles didn't have eyes and ears. And I begged people, you got to put sensors on these. And I actually gave, I made modular systems way back then with individual side scan transducers and sub bottom profiling transducers. I actually gave some. I gave one to uh, Doug Carmichael at at uh, MIT and to Dick Lidberg at the University of New Hampshire. And so I think it's wonderful. Uh, uh, the tremendous advantages, as as uh, Tim mentioned, the stability of the fish with an AUV uh, just sits dead steady. You're not yanking up and down on it. So uh, I think it's the future, and I'm delighted to uh, to see it. Megan, are these things used in the UK? Uh, so I haven't really seen much uh, AUV data, uh, data myself. Um, but it's really like beautiful data to see. Um, so I assume you're not really limited by any weather restraints so much as well. Well, weather, weather restraints are related to launch and recovery. Yes. And obviously, what sea state the boat the boat can uh, can go in. The other thing that that is which I did not mention is um, with a towed system, you you obviously lose a lot of time in the turns, okay? And the turns are also the the, the, the periods where you can you're most likely to have uh, some kind of uh, accident. Um, with the AUV, you obviously don't have this. So 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 again. The amount of ground we we think we I calculate that uh, we work at a, at about 30 to 35 percent faster with a, an AUV at better resolution. And in terms of how close into shore, I mean, are you trying to get right up to the beach? No, the we no we side scan from 50 meters outwards the the, okay. and the, the 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 that stems from two reasons one is that scuba diving has been popular in Malta since the 1950s so anything that uh, is between zero and 50 meters has probably been uh, discovered or it's covered by Posidonia seagrass now obviously tomorrow somebody's going to discover an ancient shipwreck in 45 meters why it's <laughs> You know, or something like that. But generally, we look beyond beyond traditional uh, diver depth. And 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 what we've got a question about: what's the most surprising thing you found so far? The thing that made you go, "Well, I wasn't expecting that." Um, I think I think um, rather than surprising, because we knew we were looking for them. But uh, to to actually realize, you know, when when George Robert and myself realized that we were able to identify RAM, something as small and as particular as a RAM in the side scan record, I think that is rather than surprising. That was one of the most satisfying things. Uh, I think I think it's astonishing finding a helmet. Um, absolutely astonishing. I mean, uh, Megan, you, you know, the, the seabed nature that certainly we deal with most of the time in terms of lumps and bumps and rocks, outcrops and whatnot, trying to find a single helmet head sized object uh, from side scan data is astonishing. I mean, it is pretty amazing. We, we, we can detect fairly relatively small things, but yeah. We also don't get the chance to necessarily know what we've detected in the side scan. So having the opportunity to have uh, ROV footage of it is, yeah, really amazing. Is there a is there an optimum depth to be or height above the seabed to be um, the AUV to be flying? Well, it's said to be 
10 uh, percent of your of your range right so if you're working with a 90 meter range you've got to be nine or ten meters off uh, of the seabed uh, the closer to the seabed you are the sort of the, the better resolution you get and so on uh, then there's obviously um, a trade-off with regard to safety because if you're you know if there's a world war one battleship in the middle of your survey zone the last thing you want to do is to t-bone your, your your one million plus auv into the side of this battleship because as good as the uh, the gavia forward looking sonar and object avoidance system is you know if something comes up very very sudden then then it's, it's going to be hard to avoid it We've got lots of questions about the future, but I'm going to hold those off to the end because it's always quite nice to sort of uh, look look to the future uh, as we close. Um, I've got a question about speed uh, in terms of, you know, towing speed of side scan sonars compared to the speed that the AUV is going in, because my rudimentary knowledge of side scan sonar, of course, the speed that you're running the boat at indicate helps with the controlling the, the depth. Uh, of it and presumably the amount of vibration and you know the quality of the data you're getting but presumably with an AUV you can it can run at the optimum stable speed In, uh, yes but you can only calculate what that speed is afterwards because you don't set when you're towing a fish a, 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 a side scan tow fish you're towing the tow fish at the speed of the boat and you can actually see the speed of the boat in real time with an auv you set the rpm so you're actually setting the power of the auv now if there's a slight current against you know it might go slower against the current and then come back faster so you can only see how fast the auv was actually going um after after the side scan but you don't want to be serving i think faster than around three three point five knots really and how does that compare to a tow fish towed behind a boat three point five knots more or less the same more or less the okay. same I, the time you make up is in the turns okay you mentioned earlier about um processing or reprocessing some historical data that george has been helping out with i know george has got the ability to show and share um some stuff should we do that now so yes i'm ready uh, first of all i would like to to say that i'm a, i'm not a risky man so i prefer to use the auvs in the shallow lakes and lagoons and the towing system in the open sea uh, uh, together uh, with Timmy, uh, we are not science consumer fix, but we are science consumer lovers. So we discuss a lot uh, in our common project in uh, Croatia and Greece, uh, how to advance the, the systems uh, of the, um, the detection on the on the science consumer record. So uh, the basic idea is to make a bridge uh, between the automatic sea floor classification systems and the underwater archaeology. That's why uh, we built up a, a, a software, a SonarWiz, and uh, the basic idea behind the maths uh, uh, is quite simple. So we have to take a science consumer record. From that science consumer record, we have to extract a lot of information uh, about not uh, on uh, every single uh, pixel, but every 10 or 20 uh, pixels, we have to define some parameters, the, like uh, GLCMs and textual parameters. Then we have to apply the independent component analysis, which is uh, it's more or less similar with the principal component analysis. And with this statistical treatment, we have to define the most important component based on some a certain criteria and the less important uh, component. So the important component presents the main textual characteristics and the safe parameters of the shipwreck, and the less important uh, component actually presents uh, useless information and noises. And then at the final stage, we have to compose again the site consumer record 
based only on the important independent uh, components. So this is a very nice and amazing size Casona record uh, retrieved by uh, Timmy. You can see here this ancient shipwreck, uh, an amphora cargo, and scattered uh, targets around uh, the shipwreck. Uh, we apply this size Casona record in our software with Timmy. And this is the first um, uh, component which presents actually uh, the main texture of the shipwreck and some scatter, the most important uh, scatter uh, targets. And this is a high resolution independent component. You can see more details around the shipwreck side. And then we have to combine the two, uh, the two components and we actually uh, present the final uh, limit of the essence shipwreck together with the most important targets around them. And you can see here that there is a diagram that uh, you can easily actually distinguish the cloud of the shipwreck uh, from the cloud of the seabed. So this is another example from the same, uh, uh, from the same shipwreck. This is a, a more difficult exercise because you have the nadir zone and we extract the nadir, the nadir zone with, uh, uh, with our uh, software. And you can see here the shipwreck, the two actually mounts of amphoras. This is a very high resolution uh, independent component on the shipwreck. Uh, let's say we have a resolution of about uh, uh, a size of uh, amphora. And then again, we have this uh, combine uh, result, uh, combine the two uh, most important uh, components. With that way, actually, we use this in another shipwreck in Greece, in the Fiscaldo shipwreck. And uh, with this, uh, uh, you can see here our, uh, the results of our software and the final stage collected by a client, thanks to mapping. Uh, we can easily distinguish the Asian shipwreck from the surrounding uh, rock outcrops, and you know that the Mediterranean Sea uh, is full of uh, uh, rock outcrops and uh, Posidonia meadow. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our common uh, project and uh, ideas with uh, Timmy. My pleasure, no problem. And this this is soon to be published, am I right? Yes, in the near future, let's say after two or three months. Yes. So, uh, basically, George, we can do away with the Gumbean. What, what the software does, it does away with the Gumbean classification, and it automates the identification, the identification at least of ancient of ancient shipwrecks, which is a massively helpful start, especially as you said, if you're working in a in a rocky a rocky. Yes, uh, our software, the Sonar Class software, can easily distinguish the texture, the texture of the ancient shipwreck compared to the texture of a rock outcrop. Uh, so that's the main uh, advantage of our system. But of course, we have to play a lot with a lot of shipwrecks, with a lot of examples, in order to make it better. Thank you. Okie dokie. So, uh, Marty, I know you wanted to talk a little bit uh, um, about the early use of side scan in archaeology and also you wanted to make reference to the passing of George Bass. Yes, well, I could talk a lot about this whole subject. First, uh, I do want to say hello to Gary Kozak, my friend and colleague, uh, one of the great masters of side scan sonar. Uh, we've made a lot of projects together and he's done uh, wonderful things. Uh, he doesn't actually need any of these. I'll tell you a secret. Uh, he doesn't need any of these computers or uh, he knows where the shipwrecks are by now. He just goes out there and he... <laughs> so I, I'm just celebrating uh, this year. I'm about to turn 80 years old. I'm getting ancient and I'm celebrating 60 years since I I was a student at MIT and I I was looking for something to do for a thesis and I stumbled into the lab of a uh, professor Harold Edgerton, Doc Edgerton, 
and he introduced me to this world literally 60 years ago. He introduced me <clears throat> to um, many of the leaders in the field, Jacques Cousteau and uh, and George Bass and and Alicia Linder and Ed Link and Peter Throckmorton and and uh, many other people in the archaeology world. And so one of my first projects, uh, there were two projects in 1967. It's a whole story. I just actually, I've just posted uh, on YouTube some of the story. If you contact me, I can steer you to get there. But uh, in 1967 at a conference of the Marine Technology Society in San Diego, we introduced the the first commercial side scan sonar. I was still working at EGNG back then. And right after that conference, I went off to Turkey. Uh, Doc Edgerton introduced me to George Bass, and I had a chance to work uh, off the coast of Bodrum, Turkey, with George looking for uh, a ship that uh, a, a fisherman had found a statue of, uh, they used to call it the Negro Boy Wreck now. You could call it the African boy wreck in about 300 feet. And we found it. Uh, and it was uh, amazing. And I did what I didn't realize is a little after me, Doc Edgerton went off to work with Alex McGee in, in the UK to find the Mary Rose. And uh, they, as you know, it was found. And you know, all know about the Mary Rose. It was uh, raised and it's in, uh, been restored. It's in a wonderful museum. So uh, there's a some wonderful history in this field. So we lost George recently, and I want to just say he's he has disciples. He's affected people in this field for for decades, and uh, we owe an awful lot to him. And uh, uh, it's a very sad loss for us. Somebody's telephone. <laughs> Uh, in, indeed, in fact, um, with Patrice Pomay and Tice Marleveld, all pretty much in the last three months, uh, it's been not a not a good year for us uh, in in underwater archaeology and nautical archaeology. Uh, unfortunately, I wondered, Megan, about the um, the use of or in your work, presumably your much more contract driven, development led, and the time frames that you get, and the you know you must have experiences of data sets where you just love to to be able to do more with them oh definitely yeah um i mean we're quite lucky because we do get a chance to look at so much data and it's a shame if there's certain features uh from our side on things that we identify that would probably be i don't know a gambonet but we don't ever get the chance to kind of see what the results are so it is it I mean, it's great to see all this data, but it can be frustrating when you don't get to, you pass the information on, you don't necessarily get to see the results. Um, or also because the developer uses the data to mitigate by avoiding the thing that yeah. you've identified as being probably culturally heritage and a gambin A, but you, they don't want they don't want that, so they go around it or they miss it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There have been times that I've kind of recommended things to be investigated, and then they said, oh, it's fine, we can go around it. And you're like, oh, no. But, <laughs> But it's uh, yeah, it's great to see so much data, but we don't always get to find out. But we do. There are certainly on certain jobs they do do more ROV investigations, um, but predominantly they're for sort of UXO. So they're kind of very magnetometer driven, so not necessarily interesting features identified on the sonar. Okay, thank you, um, Timmy. We got questions from a number of people with regards to you know, your love affair with side scan uh, and the role of or the place for multi-beam echo sounder, because certainly the the prettiness and the colourfulness of, of the imagery that's sort of put in the public domain from multi-beam seems to get all the glory uh, and the side scan not. But uh, clearly from your experience, that's not right. I can say that uh, categorically nothing to, to this day beats side scan sonar to detect underwater cultural heritage. Unless you're looking at mapping 
um, submerged landscapes, for example, for which multi-beam can give you digital elevation models of, of entire landscapes, drowned valleys, and so on. It's a, it's a question of physics. Don't ask me to get into the, into the details of physics, but I, I, I don't know them. But, uh, but definitely, um, and I do have, not, not, I can't pull them up quickly, but I do have data sets of multi-beam that uh, I pull up knowing that, let's say, uh, there was a marine geology survey in the area. We get the data set, we, you know, we, we look at it. We know that there's a crashed plane, uh, an aircraft crash site in that particular area. You zoom in and all you see are pixels. So very nice, very nice for geology, very nice for uh, large tracts of submerged uh, landscapes, but for looking for, for, for cultural heritage, so at least to, to this day, uh, side scan any day. There's a good Thank support you, for side scan. <laughs> yeah, Marty's very happy with that answer. May, may I say a few words about that? Uh, of course. Uh, I, I still work a lot with students. I'm involved with uh, ROV competitions and I'm still involved at MITC grant and uh, I often give lectures about a, a good engineer, a good scientist uh, knows what the tools are that are available. And to me, multi-beam is just a tool. Side scan is just a tool. They're complementary. I think that multi-beam has been way oversold in terms of chipper hunting. It's it's definitely has its place. I think people get sick of towing, so they they're starting to take these big research boats like. Bob Ballard's Nautilus or uh, the Okeanos Explorer and a number of them, uh, they're using multi-beam because you, you can say, oh, we just mapped this entire area. But uh, I see the tools as being complementary just as a, I was glad to see uh, Tim mentioned sub-bottom profiling because uh, way back in the beginning, I used sub-bottom with side scan sonar when Doc Edgerton found the Mary Rose, he used his, so, his mud penetrator and his side scan. So I think they're complementary tools, but I, I, am, I am prejudiced, but I think way, way, way more ships have been found than identified with, with side scan. It's picking the right tool for the right task to get the, for the right result, I suppose. Yep. Um, well, I've got a couple, we've got a bit more time for a couple more questions, if that's okay, Timmy uh, and folks. Absolutely. Um, we've got a news. We got one here from a recently graduated uh, archaeologist aspiring to specialise in maritime research. Which software would you recommend as a starting point for collecting reading data? Uh, Ch Chesapeake's uh, Sonar Wiz Wizma. I don't know what it's called today, but that's that's the go-to. Um, in fact, I uh, I should have included um, to illustrate the workflow. So that's the that's the software that I've been using for for years now. Um, fantastic, fantastic analytical. Uh, and look, every software, ev sorry, every um, side scan producer has its own um, has its own viewing viewing software, which is great. Um, but and then if you want to go a, um, a step further and you know to create deliverables such as georeferenced images like the one we showed of Spain, uh, target lists, etc., etc., etc. Again, and I, you know I've got no, no, obviously no commercial ties here, but I, I'm a strong believer in Chesapeake's uh, Wiz map. Uh, Harold says Sonar Wiz. So no uh, this. Uh, and that's Harold Orlowski, GM Chesapeake Technology. So um, yeah, I don't know whether that's a representative. I, I think referring to it as Sona Wizmap indicates how long I've been using it for, because that's I think uh, uh, Harold can can cor correct me here. That's the old name for it. Well, anyway. I'm sure. I'm sure, yeah. Harold says yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Harold, for, for joining us. Let's look to the future then. We've got a couple of people have asked questions uh, about the future. We've got a couple of minutes left to go. Um, we've got 
how do the panelists view the quality of sonar data today relative to their experiences developing sonar and sonar use in archaeology? What does the future hold for sonar in archaeology? Is there a role for machine learning? Uh, what else is on the horizon for innovators on the panel? Oh, gosh, There's a, that's all from one person. That's all from Peter Campbell. Uh, OK, so let's start with let's look at the view of the quality of sonar data today today relative to their experiences developing sonar use in archaeology. So over the years, let's see, I should we go to Marty first? Yes. <laughs> Marty, so for you? Well, it keeps getting better and better, but I, I do sometimes remind people it's been good for a long time. Uh, Gary, who's in the audience, uh, when he was just starting out in this field, he had one of our sonars in the Great Lakes. He was looking for for a, a ship called the Dean Richmond. And he sent me sonar pictures of shipwrecks. And to this day, some of those pictures, I, I go back and look at them, are fabulous. They show all the hatches on the ship and things like that. So it's gotten a lot better. People ask what the biggest change in our field is not the sonar, it's navigation. Uh, back in the early days, we didn't know where we were. We had in my day, we had hand bearing compasses and we had transits and theodolites and and things like that. Now you know exactly where you are, so you can run a, a mosaic, you can run a survey. But the sonar will keep getting better. I keep hoping, I, I still, I mentioned I work with students uh, that people, sonar still stinks uh, compared to optics, compared to radar. Speed of sound in water is very slow. Sound gets bounced all over the place by thermal things. It's easy to block with bubbles. I keep hoping some bright kid who knows modern technology is going to come up with something new and make all this stuff just obsolete. They're going to have a, a acoustic thing that uh, I'm not sure how, but I feel like. Uh, there's there's better things to come. The sonar itself will keep evolving. They're going to higher frequencies. There's more data processing. Uh, but uh, to take a quantum leap, we really need to uh, we need to do something new. So what Doc Edgerton would say is, what are we sitting here for? Why why are we out on a boat trying some new equipment? <laughs> What, what, does that? Somebody's asked a question about the application of lidar because you know lidar is now being used to at least map shallow water. Uh, I don't know what the depth limitations are for lidar, but is that the future? Lidar is excellent in shallow water if there isn't a lot of turbidity, uh, so it works in certain areas, and uh, uh, it's wonderful. You can you can do it from a blimp or a plane or a drone, uh, but it's not, it's only limited uses, it's still optics. Okay, so yeah, so British waters then, not gonna be used. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe maybe Malta, but not in Britain. Um, I've got, I'm gonna put one of these future questions to, to Megan actually, with regards to a role for machine learning, because you're a human being employed to do a job to look at data sets, that are you going to be out of a job in 30 years time because computers will be able to do all of this for you? I mean, I hope not. Um, I think there will be a move towards more sort of uh, auto picking. So like George was showing us some kind of ways to identify features in the data. Um, and, you know, th things are starting to move that way now, but still what we're finding, at least in our kind of experience with it is sort of it, doesn't necessarily always detect things, so it's really interesting seeing what George is working on. Um, but I think that is probably the way that it's going now. It's a profession, presumably, where somebody who's been in it for 20 years see things on a screen that somebody who's new to it doesn't see, because you get an eye. Yeah. The opposite, the opposite is also true, that uh, people who've never seen side scans start seeing a whole load of things that uh, the op the side scan operator you know knows automatically uh, is is not so the, the 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 new viewer will be overly keen 
which is not a bad thing because that's like playing with you know playing with a toy in the uh, in, in when you first have it that's when you get to know uh, when you get to know the da the data so one of the things we do is sort of we click a lot on this i get my students to click a lot on the seabed to train their eye as 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 you rightly said mark to get used to what's not data because once you get used to that what is well, what's not archaeology once you get used to that then your eye starts to fall on what is or what could be you know a b or a c or maybe even an a uh, a's are easy to identify the b's and the c's are the difficult ones yeah okay george what about you then in terms of the future on the horizon you know once your paper's published what's what's next for you in the next in the next years uh, I would like to, to say that uh, probably surprised you uh, that I strongly believe that uh, an experienced interpreter is better than the best software. So I really prefer the experienced science concerned interpreter uh, compared to the software. I think that we have now excellent science concerned system. With the USBL, we, we, we know the exact position of, of, of the toll. I still remember back in the 80s trying to, to correct the, the distortions of the, of the records of the science concerned on the papers. So now it, it's, it's, it's a new era and we can do anything we want. Uh, I would like also to mention, I made to, to make a comment uh, in, in the previous discussion, our uh, discussion. Uh, the multi beam system is an excellent system for the coastal zone and for the reconstruction of the paleogeographic evolution of the coastal zone. But the site concerner is still the best system for ancient shipwreck detection at water depth. Uh, deeper than 100 meters. It's the only system to detect shipwreck in uh, in a very quick fashion uh, at the deep water. Okay, so then, folks, thank you so much, uh, Timmy, and to all our discussants. Thank you to Megan, to George, uh, to Marty, and thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today's webinar. On behalf of the Nautical Archaeology Society, on behalf of our sponsors, the Honor Frost Foundation, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe.